Welcome back to week one of the first term of anatomy and physiology. This is lecture two of week one, where we're going to be considering chapter two entitled Chemistry Comes Alive. Chapter two will be presented as a two-part lecture. And in our last chapter, with lecture one of this week, we took a short review of anatomy and physiology. We talked about the branches in the study of anatomy, gross and microscopic, and I mentioned we had spent most of our time studying A and P systemically that is studying the various systems one by one through the school year. With each chapter, we'll be doing this both at the gross level as well as some microscopic level before we consider physiology of a given body system being studied. In chapter one, we also covered the six levels of structural organization or hierarchy of the body, and then we went on to look at the eight necessary functions of survival. Thereafter, we talked about survival needs, nutrients, oxygen, water, maintaining a certain body temperature and atmospheric pressure, all of the things our body needs to function and survive. We reviewed the six components contributing toward homeostasis while looking at examples of both positive and negative feedback, the steps, components, which we'll revisit time and again this school year as we consider physiology of various body systems. Further, we considered standard anatomical position and why it's important for anatomists and medical practitioners, then reviewed various terms and language to help us discuss the body. Finally, we reviewed the various body cavities and the membranes associated with these cavities. In this chapter, we'll continue our review of material in two parts. In our first lecture of this chapter, we'll focus on basic chemistry concepts by defining things such as elements and matter. We'll look at atomic number and mass number, and then consider isotopes. We'll move on to the topic of energy, where we'll consider potential energy and kinetic energy, that is the energy at rest and the energy of motion, as well as look at common forms of energy in the body, chemical energy, mechanical, and electrical energy. We'll then review the three types of chemical bonds, making up the matter in our body ionic and covalent bonds, as well as hydrogen bonds. And finally, we'll conclude the first lecture of chapter two with the types of chemical reactions we find and the factors that influence them. As we move to the second lecture of this chapter with lecture three this week, we'll go ahead and focus our time on a short review of biochemistry by considering enzymes, as well as moving on to a discussion of macromolecules, specifically carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. As we cover material in chapter two, we will be leaving behind the discussion of DNA and RNA, coming back to it later on in the term if there is time. So you'll see it in the textbook, but we won't go into it in much detail other than as a discussion of nucleic acids while considering macromolecules. As we look at the basic concepts of chemistry, you might ask yourself why we're visiting chemistry when this is anatomy and physiology. Chemical reactions underlie all of our body's physiological processes, and a strong foundation in basic chemical principles can help us understand the complexities of the various body systems, including the workings of the nervous system, the cardiovascular system, the endocrine system, the respiratory system, renal system, digestive system, as well as our understanding of metabolism. A firm foundation in chemistry can also help future medical practitioners understand medical matters. For instance, understanding chemistry can help us determine what chemicals are needed for our body to function properly, as well as understand why systems in our body might malfunction. Understanding chemistry can also help us understand how different drugs work in the body, such as why some drugs can cross the blood-brain barrier and others cannot, or why some drugs can be taken with certain foods and others cannot. Understanding chemistry can help us understand acid-base reactions, which goes hand in hand with controlling the pH in our body. This is critically important when we look at the respiratory system as well as the renal system. Finally, chemistry and biochemistry can help us understand how we can obtain energy from the foods we eat, our carbohydrates, our lipids, as well as proteins, and how, when malnourished, we might use alternate sources in our body to garner the energy we need to survive. Our textbook offers a brief review of atoms and elements as we consider matter. So let's go ahead and first consider matter. What is matter? It's something you've been asked time and again through junior high, high school, and college, likely with each science class you've taken. Matter is anything that has mass and takes up space, be it a solid, a liquid, or a gas. It's made up of elements, substances that cannot be broken down to other substances by chemical reactions. And important in the study of the body, we move from matter to elements. Let's talk about elements for a moment. Things like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, 
These elements are the primary substances from which all things in the body are built. Elements have unique chemical and physical properties. They're designated by chemical symbols we see on a periodic table, typically one or two letter abbreviations, often being named after planets, mythological figures, geographical locations, or famous people. And finally, here in the middle, we have atoms. For all intents and purposes in this course, Atoms are the building blocks of elements, the smallest chemical units of matter that retain the properties and characteristics of an element, composed of positively charged protons, negatively charged electrons, and uncharged neutrons. When we consider elements, we need to know the element's atomic number and atomic mass. So let's go ahead and look at these two definitions. Atoms of various elements differ in their number of subatomic particles that is the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. But what we find is that all atoms of a given element, for instance, when we talk about carbon, which is abbreviated on the periodic table by the letter C, all atoms of a given element have the same number of protons in their nucleus. And this is good information to have because the number of protons, which is unique to the element, is called the atomic number. And scientists write this as, here, a subscript to the left of the symbol of an element. In an electrically neutral atom, the atomic number also tells us the number of electrons because the number of protons tends to be the number of electrons when we consider an electrically neutral atom. We can discuss the number of neutrons from a second number we call the mass number, which is the total number of protons and neutrons that are held in the nucleus of a given atom. Mass number is written as a superscript here to the left of the element symbol. Considering mass number, although all atoms of a given element have the same number of protons, some atoms have more neutrons than other atoms of the same element. And these different atomic forms of the same element found in nature are called isotopes of an element. They behave identically in chemical reactions, but because neutrons have mass, the mass number between isotopes of an element will vary. This ends up being helpful in science where, because they're recognizable, they can be used as tracers, providing an efficient way to track biological processes during experimentation. Isotopes are found naturally, and carbon is an example of this. We see carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14 naturally occurring in the world. Carbon-12 is the most predominant, with six protons as well as six neutrons, but we also see carbon-13, again, six protons, but now we have a different number of neutrons. We have seven neutrons. And we also find carbon-14. Again, six protons, but now we have eight neutrons. So what is different? It is our mass number that's going to be different. All of these isotopes of carbon have the same atomic number of six, but a different mass number. And that mass number differs because we have a different number of neutrons. Next, let's talk about energy. Energy is defined as the capacity to cause change or the ability to do work, ultimately putting matter into motion. When talking about energy, we often look at two forms of energy, kinetic energy and potential energy. And let's go ahead and start with potential energy. Potential energy is the energy of position or the energy matter possesses because of its location or structure. And in the human body, this is important because potential energy is stored in the form of chemical energy made up of the bonds between atoms and molecules. In contrast, kinetic energy is the form of energy powering any type of matter in motion. In addition to kinetic and potential energy, there are other forms of energy important in anatomy and physiology. As I mentioned a moment ago, we have chemical energy. We also have mechanical energy and electrical energy. All three of these are important within the human body. Chemical energy, as I stated, is the energy made up of bonds that hold atoms together to make molecules or compounds. In chemical energy, we see potential energy become kinetic energy as bonds are broken. We also have mechanical energy, which is stored in the human body and directly powers the movement of matter. When we lift a book and put it on a bookshelf, our muscles provide the mechanical energy needed to move the book. Finally, and critical to our survival is electrical energy resulting from the movement of charged particles, which helps us transmit impulses through our nervous system and power our muscles. Moving along in our review of chemistry and cell biology, we can now consider chemical bonds, the idea that atoms bond together to create molecules or compounds, and in doing so become more stable than their individual atomic units. We're going to look at both ionic bonds and covalent bonds, 
And then after looking at covalent bonds, we will consider hydrogen bonding. Let's go ahead and consider ionic bonds first. An ionic bond is defined as a bond that forms as a result of an attraction between ions of opposite charge, creating a stable molecular compound. So what does that mean? Well, atoms are electrically neutral when the number of positive charges, the protons, equals the number of negative charges, the electrons. But sometimes atoms want to gain or give up an electron to become more stable. You might recall from a chemistry class, this is due to filling of electrons in the valence shell of an atom. And when that happens, when we take on an extra electron or give up an electron to become more stable, the balance of protons and electrons is thrown off. If an atom gains electrons, it acquires an overall negative charge, and we call that ion an anion. If an atom loses an electron, it acquires an overall positive charge, and we now call that ion a cation. These negatively or positively charged atoms are categorized more generally as ions. And so let's go ahead and see an example of that. We'll go ahead and consider sodium chloride. Sodium has 11 electrons if we're looking at the periodic table. 11 electrons, chloride has 17 electrons. And so when we look at the valence shells of each of these two atoms, we're going to see that sodium has a valence shell with one lone electron. We're going to see here's sodium and we saw sodium has 11 protons as well as 11 electrons and so these shells that surround the protons and neutrons within the nucleus are going to be filled with electrons and our first shell always has two electrons our second can hold eight our third can hold eight however given that sodium has 11 protons as well as then 11 electrons we'll see that sodium's electrons will fill the most inner shell with two and then we see eight in the next shell but our valence electron this is the electron that the electron shell that interacts with other atoms is only going to have one electron this is very unstable we're going to go ahead now and look at chlorine chlorine has 17 protons it also has 17 electrons and so as we fill these shells of electrons we're going to see two fall into the first we fill the second with eight, we fill our last one with the remaining electrons, of which we have seven. Now, this is also unstable. Chlorine will want to fill its shell to pick up one more electron, and so it does that. At the same time, sodium will want to get rid of this electron so that it becomes more stable. Now, as we get rid of one electron here, Sodium will become positively charged. As we accept an electron here, we're going to see that the addition of the electron to this valence shell with chlorine will now create a negative charge. A positively charged ion and a negatively charged ion are going to be attracted to one another. And in fact, what they will do, that positive and negative charge, create what's called an ionic bond. That ionic bond will create a stable compound. Generally, ionic bonds form between metals and non-metals of the periodic table, and the position of two atoms on the periodic table are often very far apart, usually on opposite sides of the periodic table. In contrast to ionic bonds where positively and negatively charged ions are attracted to one another to create a bond, a covalent bond is a chemical bond formed by two atoms that share one or more pairs of electrons, and this is key. In covalent bonding, we share one or more pairs of electrons because as we just saw with ionic bonds, sometimes electrons are given up or accepted. But in the case of covalent bonds, we are sharing electrons. And due to the sharing of electrons, covalent bonds tend to be stronger and more common than ionic bonds. We consider molecular oxygen, where two oxygen atoms join together to form a covalent bond in a very stable molecule. Looking at oxygen on the periodic table, we would see that oxygen has eight protons and in turn it ha would have eight electrons. With this in mind, we're going to look here at an atom of oxygen. We'll see eight protons and neutrons in the nucleus and then we're going to see eight electrons surrounding the nucleus, of which within our first orbit or shell, we will see the two electrons. In turn, when we look at our next shell, we have six more to place because we had a total of eight, of which those six go in that valence shell, leaving the shell open to two more electrons. 
this is unstable. We do the exact same thing with this oxygen atom. We see our protons and neutrons in the nucleus, of which there are six each, and then we're going to take our electrons and fill those up within the orbits, of which the first two fall into the first orbit. We have six remaining that go into our valence shell. Our valence shell holds up to eight. We have six. It would like two more. It is unstable. With this in mind, what's going to happen when both of these atoms are unstable? In this case, they're going to overlap those electron orbits in order to share electrons. And that's what's going to happen. If we look at our first oxygen molecule here, we're going to see one, two, three, four, five electrons, a shared sixth, a shared seventh, and eight electrons. So this outer shell is stable. If we look at our second oxygen molecule, we're going to see one, two, three, four electrons, a shared fifth, six, seven, and a shared eighth. A total of eight electrons being shared, thus creating a stable filled orbit. And in this case, we create molecular oxygen. Generally, now in comparison to ionic bonds, covalent bonds form between nonmetals and the position of two atoms on the periodic table is close together. To understand the next type of bond, the hydrogen bond, we actually need to look at covalent bonds in a little more depth. And specifically, we must consider the term electronegativity or the strength by which electrons are pulled toward a given atom resulting in one atom of a molecule or a compound slightly more negative than another atom in the same molecule or compound. The idea of electronegativity gives way to the concept that covalent bonds can be polar or nonpolar. This shouldn't be new to you based on prior classes you've taken. Nonpolar covalent bonds result in the equal sharing of electrons between atoms in a molecule or compound whereas polar covalent bonds result in the unequal sharing of electrons between atoms of a molecule or compound. This image here gives you an idea of the atoms on the periodic table that are electronegative, that is, that pull electrons toward themselves, that are selfish with that electrons, that like to hog electrons. And the trends show that generally, as we move from left to right across the rows, we go from low electronegativity to higher electronegativity. Further, we go from lower electronegativity and move up columns to higher electronegativity. For most intents and purposes within our bodies, we focus on high electronegativity of oxygen and nitrogen. Now, we can consider an example of water, a highly polar covalent molecule, whereby we're going to see that oxygen loves electrons and pulls electrons toward it, which means that electrons are going to spend more time here in the orbit around oxygen than those electrons spend orbiting around the respective hydrogen molecules. That is going to create a somewhat negative nature of oxygen, which we call delta negative, while leaving the two hydrogen atoms slightly positive in nature, which we denote as delta positive here. In turn, we can take this one water molecule and we can go ahead and look at multiple water molecules to consider hydrogen bonding as it pertains to water. Here we have a water molecule, H2O, by which, as I mentioned earlier, oxygen is very electronegative, and as a result, electrons spend more of their time circling in orbit here as compared to here. That is going to leave a slight delta negative or slight negative charge surrounding oxygen and a slight positive charge surrounding each of these hydrogen atoms. Now, when we consider this in detail, let's go ahead and look at a couple of water molecules now. Remember, our oxygen is going to be slightly delta negative, hydrogen slightly delta positive. We're going to see some hydrogen bonds form here between the oxygen of this molecule and the hydrogen of this molecule of water. In turn, we can see the same thing here. Here's a delta negative, here's a delta positive. We see attraction here between those weak forces that are slightly positive and negative forming hydrogen bonds here. This is the foundation by which we're going to see proteins put together as well as the helices 
of our DNA. We have a, a double helices, two strands running together by which those strands are held together with hydrogen bonds. So in our body, we find oxygen that's electronegative as well as we see nitrogen working in this way. And so hydrogen will be attracted to nitrogen to create hydrogen bonds and hydrogen will be attracted to oxygen in those electronegative ways. So now that we have a visual of how hydrogen bonding comes to be through the electronegativity of certain atoms, leaving some atoms with a slightly positive charge, some with a slightly negative charge, and we see that attraction between those slightly positive and slightly negative atoms within a molecule or compound. I think that allows us to better understand hydrogen bonds, but let's just go ahead. I do have a slide here that just recaps everything with hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonds are loose attractions formed between hydrogen and most commonly in our bodies, oxygen or nitrogen, as I've mentioned. They're weak. The attractions are weak, which results from this process of constantly forming and breaking these attractions. Now, although they're weak, they are strong when we consider many hydrogen bonds put together. And we're going to see that this is important in proteins as well as it's important in holding the double helix of DNA together. And we'll see that later on. Conditions by which we disrupt the integrity of proteins or DNA as a result of a change in environment that breaks these hydrogen attractions with these electronegative atoms. We step away from the general discussion of chemical bonds to focus our attention on chemical reactions. A chemical reaction is the foundation of all life processes and it occurs when bonds are formed, rearranged, or when they're broken. Chemical reactions can be studied by looking at a chemical equation. And this is just a very basic chemical equation. We begin with reactants and through a series of steps, we end with products. In an equation, we have typically reactants on the left or the starting substances of a chemical reaction on one side and the products or the ending substances produced by that chemical reaction on the other side. The arrow in between, we see that it looks a little different. We have an arrow pointed both ways. This is an equilibrium arrow and it tells us that under certain conditions, we go from reactants to products and in other conditions, we may go from products to reactants. Something to keep in mind, in a chemical reaction, the total mass of our reactants are going to equal the total mass of our products. This is known as the law of conservation of mass. There are four basic types of chemical reactions, of which we're going to spend most of our time here with synthesis and decomposition reactions, so I will leave these, but you should have studied these in a prior course. Throughout the countless thousands of different chemical reactions that occur in our body, we commonly build things up, which we refer to as anabolism, or typically dehydration or condensation processes, and we might break things down, which we call catabolism. Maybe we're breaking glucose down in the process of glycolysis and cell respiration to produce ATP. Combined, this idea of building things up and breaking things down, or catabolism and anabolism, we have a process that we call metabolism, which refers to all of the chemical reactions that take place in the body. Our discussion of chemical reactions wouldn't be complete without talking about four factors that influence our chemical reactions. That is to say whether chemicals are going to collide with enough force for a reaction to take place. First of all, we have temperature. Nearly all chemical reactions occur at a faster rate at higher temperatures. At high temperatures, particles move faster, and as they move faster, they're more likely to come into contact and react with one another. In addition, we have catalysts. Catalysts influence chemical reactions. When we consider biochemistry, a catalyst is a substance that increases the rate of a chemical reaction without itself undergoing any change. And most important, catalysts in the body are called enzymes. Most enzymes in the body are composed of protein and they work by lowering the level of energy needed. So the energy that needs to be invested in a chemical reaction, the threshold level of energy that needs to break a bond in the reactants or do something that ensures that a reaction takes place. And enzymes help lower that energy, that energy we call activation of energy or the initial investment of energy that's needed to start a reaction. Without an enzyme acting as a catalyst, 
a much larger investment of energy is needed to ignite a chemical reaction. And we'll look at this further when we consider enzymes in our next lecture. We have the concentration of reactants that plays a role in determining whether a chemical reaction takes place or how quickly a chemical reaction takes place. Now, let's look at an analogy for this. Imagine you're on a dance floor. Now, if just a few other people are at on a dance floor, you're unlikely to step on one another's toes. But the more people that get up to dance, the more likely it is you're going to step on one another's toes. Collisions of molecules are similar. The more particles that are present within a given space, the more likely these particles are to bump into one another. This means we can speed up chemical reactions in two ways, either by increasing the number of particles in a given space or by decreasing the volume of the space. In this particular instance, we're talking about increasing the concentration of reactants. So we're putting more people out on the dance floor. Finally, we consider the particle size as it influences chemical reactions. Generally, the smaller the particle, the faster it moves, the more likely it is to react. So these are four factors that influence whether and how quickly a chemical reaction takes place. And with this slide, we're going to finish lecture two of week one. And when we return for lecture three, we'll pick up on the study of enzymes in more detail, something I just hinted out here, as I mentioned catalysts, and we'll go into the discussion of macromolecules. So make it a great day, everyone.